Hello, good afternoon. My name is Kevin Rosofsky. Welcome to our webinar. We're really excited to have you. We are going to be introducing today the SRX platform, Benchtop platform, and we have uh, David Duffy, who's employee number two in the company, who's our chief technology officer, is going to be going through some details and some slides that I think will really fire you up to what this technology is going to be able to achieve. Prior to David, um, I'm going to just provide a little bit of a perspective around the company. Many of you know we just went public last week and raised another $75 million. Um, we've raised over $150 million in the last uh, three years trying to further develop out this technology. We think that it's really got great potential, and many of our customers have taught us the key features that they feel are important. And so to start off, just want to say that and at the highest level, we believe that the sooner you can detect disease, the better chance you have of survival and the lower cost it's going to be to create therapies for survival. And the biomarker concentration in general gets more concentrated the closer to death that you are relative to the disease. And so disease progression typically elevates the concentration of proteins and blood, and this is um, a key to our technology is utilizing sensitivity to try to, to further help um, see disease sooner. But we're also trying to significantly reduce the invasiveness of testing instead of a lumbar puncture or spinal tap or biopsy where you might have very high concentrations of the biomarker. We're trying to also lower the invasiveness. And today, if you look at disease to detection opposite invasiveness, you'll find that we've done pretty well with infectious disease. We've lowered the invasiveness, and we are seeing disease uh, fairly early. This is just an illustrative example. Cardio, we've done pretty well with the cath and, and continue to evolve, um, you know, earlier and earlier detection to help heart patients prior to the cardiac event. But cancer and neurology seem to be still very much challenged. They're uh, very late stage. In fact, in the area of neurology, CTE is still requires post-humanist autopsies to diagnose, and even certain forms of Alzheimer's are still being diagnosed um, through autopsies posthumously. So we really know there's a long way to go with cancer and neurology, and so a lot of our focus as a company has been on those two categories as well as infectious disease and cardio. But um, our goal is to try to move this down, less invasive, into the left earlier detection. And today, you know, we have detection limits that are about 9 picograms per ml, and there's about 205 approved, FDA-approved immunoassay diagnostic tests in that category. And there's a, um, almost 1,300 that can be done via LDT that are consist consistently detected with IA technology. We believe, though, by moving the detection limit down to 0 0.01 picogram per ml, that that's going to have a fairly profound opportunity on both invasiveness and the ability to see the uh, disease earlier. And we estimate there could be as many as 10,000 secreted proteins that you really couldn't um, identify and, and measure, particularly concentrations that are very um, low abundance markers that you're going to now be able to see. And so we're really excited about this area. And one of the areas, neurology, is where there's just been a, an avalanche of recent um, publications further showcasing some of these critical biomarkers for, you know, looking at brain health in the blood non-invasively. So when you look across oncology now, we've got 39 different markers that have been done inside of Samoa, the technology you're, you're learning about today from Quanterix. In the area of neuro, there's now 49 markers. There's almost 80 publications, third-party peer-reviewed pubs. And then between inflammation and infectious disease, there's another 67 publications and 95 different markers. So this slide just illustrates that the traditional ELISA nanogram per ml was really uh, became active in 1975 to the, two, to the 1990s as you know, real go-to technology. Then electrochemiluminescence moved in around 2000, but really in the last uh, three or four years is when we've moved into this femtogram per ml capability of Quanterix. And a lot of the focus, believe it or not, has been on um, what we call environmental factors, looking at the role that diet or sleep or exercise, stress, concussions, pollution, drugs, the fourth leading cause of death in the United States due to side effects and adverse effects to drugs, lifestyle, infections, radiation. How do these different environmental factors affect the proteins in the body um, that maybe the twins might be born with the same 
basic DNA, but then as time goes on, uh, one twin might grow up to get cancer, the other one grows up to get diabetes. And so looking at the protein, we feel is a very relevant area because of this disease cascade and the role of all of the environmental epigenetic uh, factors on the protein, as well as we think that the protein is, is more abundant. And so by applying greater sensitivity to the higher abundant, more relevant marker, we think it can have a pretty profound effect on healthcare. This slide just illustrates some of the more established uh, protein markers that are out there. And the yellow represents their normal um, area clinical level of concentration. The green on the right is the typical today's technology's ability to detect it. And it normally happens after disease cascades occur, which means that the, the protein gets elevated. And then on the left-hand side, you can see where Quanteric's limit of detection has been achieved at 2.5 uh, times standard deviations. And you can see that this is just one example, but on the example we're shown here, there's been a fairly significant improvement in sensitivity, which we showed on an earlier slide that that sensitivity improvement's being used for less invasiveness and, and earlier detection, but it's also being used for higher abundant markers to eliminate metric, matrix effects by simply diluting. And so we have a lot of customers now that are going after higher abundant markers and using dilution to improve the matrix effects. And so that's another major category of opportunity as we continue to evolve. And so what we've been working with uh, pharmaceutical companies um, over the last three years um, on efficacy and toxicity markers. And there's now evidence that there's an increase of over 200% probability that a drug can make it to market if it deploys biomarker technologies in its trials. And Surprising to us, the speed of adoption has been fairly um, formidable. There's already been 750 phase one, phase two, phase three trials, primarily in cancer and autoimmune disease, but we're now starting to see a lot of uh, mood studies and brain health studies in neurology that's pretty exciting. I think we've actually run seven inside of Quanterix today in our accelerator services for pharma and biotech companies. We've also um, deployed um, 22 different instruments into CROs over the last 12 months, uh, 18 months. And so this is a, a very rapid opportunity to keep evolving the technology. You know, three, three years ago when we started, these were the original pioneering companies that used the technology. And then the following year in 2016, we were able to continue um, spreading the technology throughout the market. But... We're really excited that over the last 12 months, we've further expanded this in all areas of research, pharma, and other areas. And so it's become a real go-to technology, and we think it's going to lead to an incredible pipeline of, of companion diagnostic opportunities. These are um, one area here is um, for just cancer and looking at the immune system particularly and looking at PKPD modeling um, and patient stratification. I think um, rules-based medicine, uh, Ralph McDade's our CEO, is an incredible leader that's been utilizing our technology. I think we have three of our systems now running around the clock. But 75% of the markers down at the bottom left corner are now um, being asked to be um, applied even with the Luminex technology. So we're real excited that there's a need for this level of sensitivity and the precision that we're able to create with the dilution on the more abundant markers. And so that combination is been really um, effective for us as, and our customers, and we're going to continue trying to evolve it. In the area of neuro neurodegeneration, this slide just shows just how rapidly, once we were put on Good Morning America to talk about the ability to see concussions in blood based on the NFL General Electric Head Health Challenge that Quanterix won, there was an explosion of publications that occurred around the world for Tau, and then ultimately um, NFL Neurofilament Light now led to um, biopharmas, most of those that have, um, we'll call them neurological drugs in the pipeline are now utilizing multiple systems and trials, trying to get better under, understanding of how to move the biomarkers of that disease pathway with the least amount of dosing, and then to try to minimize side effects or adverse conditions by also then looking at the toxicity markers. And so a lot of large trials are being run, and we continue to see this as being a an area of great momentum for the future opportunity. There's now publications across all of these disease criteria and these disease categories in, neurolo in neurology. On the right-hand side, you can see our menu continues to expand. We now have um, a three-plex and a four-plex that further helps the 
economics of the testing and improving the the, the level of sample. A lot of times there's just small samples, not enough um, sample to run multiple tests. So multiplexing is allowing us to further preserve samples. And this just shows um, the pipeline of all the companies that are now utilizing it for neurology. And it's the fastest area of growth of our company right now. I think almost 70% of our sales is now coming from neurology, but um, oncology is, is very rapidly starting to pick up with a lot of the new PDL1 efforts and immuno-oncology uh, drug trials. So um, I'll close off by just saying that we do have um, a summit that we founded a couple years ago called Powering Precision Health. And it's an incredible opportunity to see from all of our customers to stand up and they present. We had 54 speakers on October 23rd and 24th. We had 18 different sponsors, including Pfizer and um, LabCorp and uh, BioRad and you know all of the majors are now sponsoring this and we'll have we expect over a thousand attendees this coming year it'll be in September but it's a chance to see these technologies in the disruptive way in which the technology is forming um, and allowing you to see biomarkers um, non-invasively and so just in summary um, you know we have a digital technology that we're applying to see in both health and disease trying to do that with as less invasiveness as possible across all the relevant markers, and you're going to hear our new technology also will run nucleic acids. And we have a lot of validation with over 170 peer-reviewed third-party publications. We have over 700 um, trials that have been run now, um, and our 23 of the top 25 pharma companies now on um, our system, many with multiple systems. And someday we will evolve this into a point-of-care technology as well. So um, that's our summary, and we are focused very heavily on investing to future, for future platforms, and, and the customers here really make us, and so any of your ideas on how we can continue to improve, we appreciate it, and we'll keep rolling out platforms over the next several years to ensure we meet all of your needs. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to uh, David. Thanks, Kevin, for the great uh, background uh, on the SRX uh, and Samoa. So... I'm going to be describing our new platform. It's called the uh, SRX, and I think I'll skip past the introduction slides because Kevin did such a great job uh, explaining uh, what we're up to here at Quanterix. And uh, this is the instrument. This is a benchtop uh, single molecule reader. And what I'm going to do is I'm first going to give a background on the Samoa technology uh, for those of you that are not familiar with it. I'm going to describe some recent applications of Samoa, some kind of the recent publications that have been coming out that are very exciting. And then the meat of the presentation will be around how the SRX works and how do you use it, how do you get data out of it. And I'm gonna illustrate the kind of power of the SRX and the kind of data that we've been generating at Quanterix and now we're starting uh, at customer sites as well. <clears throat> I'd imagine that you've probably got some questions as they arise, but uh, at the moment I've got everybody on mute. So if you do have any questions, then type them into the ch uh, chat box of the GoToMeeting app, and I'll try to leave a few minutes at the end so that we can uh, answer any questions that you have. So uh, why single molecule arrays and, and why so sensitive? And, and really, the, the idea behind the technology that came out of Tufts University is to uh, move things from the analog uh, world into the digital world. So we run ELISA. Uh, most of you will be familiar with ELISA. Um, where you have a, uh, a well and you code it with an antibody. You add a sample, the sample, the proteins in the sample get captured by the antibodies. They get labeled with a secondary antibody that's got an enzyme on it. The enzyme turns over a substrate to produce a fluorescent or colorimetric product. Now the problem with the regular ELISA is that those product molecules diffuse into this relatively large volume, about 100 microliters. And that diffusion basically dilutes those molecules and makes them hard to detect. So you need millions of enzymes producing trillions of fluorophores to reach the detection limit. What we do with Samoa is instead of running one reaction on all the molecules at once, we break down uh, each of those molecules into individual reactors and we run the enzyme substrate reaction uh, one at a time. So the way that we do that is we have arrays that, that Kevin pointed out where we have 240,000 about uh, wells. Each well has a volume of about 50 femtoliters, which is about 2 billion times smaller than a regular ELISA well. So we have our enzyme label protein trapped in that well, and then we do our trick. And our trick that gives all the sensitivity is to seal up the arrays with oil. So if you have an enzyme in there turning over the 
the substrate to produce the products. Instead of diffusing away, those product molecules are trapped in, in the well, and you get a very high local concentration of fluorophore. And it's really easy to see that trapped set of molecules under a microscope. So you go from needing millions of molecules to detect to needing a single molecule to detect, and that's really the, the sensitivity that underlies the Samoa technology. So the way that we do the assay today, and it was described in Nature Biotech in 2010, is, is shown here, and we use uh, beads to do the capture of the molecules in the first place. So we start with a sample, and we typically use about 25 microliters of sample that gets diluted up to 100 microliters with buffers to improve recoveries. And we add the beads. These beads are magnetic, and they're coated in the uh, antibody, the protein that you want to detect. There's about half a million of these beads typically, and these beads are really efficient at literally sucking all the protein out of, of solution. They're very specific. Even with nanomolar binding antibodies, we can capture pretty much all the proteins at femtomolar concentrations. So once you've captured your protein, then what you do is you label it with a secondary antibody shown here with a biotin on it, and then label that with streptavidin beta galactosidase. The way that we get to single molecule uh, distribution over these beads is plasma statistics. So if you have half a million beads, uh, what we have at one femtomolar in 100 microliters is about uh, 60,000 molecules. So you've got 60,000 molecules distributed over half a million beads. So you can imagine that about 90% of those beads will have nothing on them, and the majority of the beads that do have a molecule on them will only have a single molecule. So that's how we, we get to single molecules. So once you have these beads and they've got their label proteins on them, what we do is we read them out. And we do that by uh, injecting the beads onto the Samoa disk that's shown up to the top right here. It's got the 24 arrays around the edge, each one having 240,000 uh, microwells. And I should say that the disk is used in both of our platforms, both the HD1 and the, and the SRX. The beads get injected in with the substrate, and by gravity, they fall into the wells. And then we seal up the uh, wells with oil, this, this magical trick that uh, I mentioned at the start. And so we form this nice liquid tight seal around the well. And then we start imaging those arrays. So we take uh, very high resolution uh, microscope images at five different fluorescent wavelengths, one of which is the uh, fluorescence of the, 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 sub, uh, the product of the enzyme substrate reaction. So if there's a bead in the well and it's associated with an enzyme, then that well will grow, grow glow brightly in our arrays, and if there isn't uh, an enzyme associated with that bead, then it'll stay dark. And what we do is we determine the fraction of active beads, uh, and that's the fundamental unit of, of Samoa. So you might ask, how do we know that there's a bead in the well? And the way that we do this enables us to multiplex the technology. So what we've done is we've, uh, before we immobilize the antibodies on the beads, we uh, attach one of four different fluorescent dyes on the surface of those beads. So we basically color code beads, and uh, right now we've got six codes that we, that we can have customers use. We've developed the capability for doing up to 35 different codes now. So what you do is for each of those subcodes, you're able to attach a particular antibody for a particular protein. You then mix those subpopulations together and add them to the sample, and those beads very specifically grab uh, the protein that they're designed for, you then add a mixture of detection antibodies that correspond to those different proteins, and you can form an immunocomplex on each of those beads. The beads are then loaded and sealed an image exactly the same way as they are for a single-plex assay, but now with our, by, by uh, looking at the fluorescent wavelengths of the dyes on the beads, we can determine which bead is in the well, i.e. which protein is in, in the well, so we can determine uh, the fraction of active beads for each of those different bead types, and we described this in lab on a chip about four years ago. Just to talk a little bit about the unit of Samoa and the statistics behind it, you, if you get familiar with Samoa, you'll know a lot about AEB, which stands for average number of enzymes to bead. This is really the ratio of molecules to beads. It's the fundamental parameter in the Poisson distribution equation. Uh, and a simple way to explain it is shown here, where say we have 10 beads and we're at very low concentrations, where you've only got one molecule over those 10 beads, then AEB is equal to 0.1. You've got one divided by 10. And in this case, the arrays kind of look like the stars at night. There aren't many active beads, and there's only single enzymes on them, so they're kind of dim. As you go higher in concentration to, so say, where you have six molecules for every 10 beads, 
then the pattern distribution equation will say you've mostly got single molecules on those beads, but now you've got a pretty good chance of having two molecules or even three molecules on those beads. So now the array starts to look a little bit brighter. Uh, fortunately, we don't need to distinguish between one, twos, and three molecules on a bead because Pratt and statistics will convert the fraction of on beads into AB. So we're still in the digital world. Once you get to a much higher concentrations where you've got more molecules and beads, then basically what happens is that every bead has a molecule on it and you cannot digitally count anymore. So what we do there now, and it's the system software that does that, it averages the intensity of all of the beads divide that by what a single enzyme produces, and that also equals AB. So by doing this, we can stitch together the digital world with the analog world and come up with a very broad dynamic range in, in our measurement. So uh, in this experiment, what we were doing was really looking at the dynamic range and the sensitivity to the enzyme label. So we had biotinylated beads, and we incubated them with decreasing concentrations of streptavid in beta galactosidase, which is our enzyme reporter. And we titrated that molecule all the way down to 220 zeptomolar, which is about 10 molecules in, in 100 microliters. So this is about 100 times more sensitive than any other ELISA that had been reported up to that point, which was alkaline phosphatase detection by chemiluminescence. And by combining the digital world, which is given by this equation, and the analog world, we got about six and a half logs of dynamic range. And when you go to an immunoassay, you have a background, so you give up some of that dynamic range, but we end up having usually four and a half logs of dynamic range for when you have an immunoassay. So the very first experiment we did is shown here. This was uh, reported in that Nature Biotech paper that I mentioned, and we were looking at a prostate-specific antigen, PSA, and this was in uh, cancer patients who'd had a radical prostatectomy to the point where, because the source of the biomarker had been removed, the level of PSA in their blood dropped to what was below conventional uh, detection limits. So in Kevin's analogy of the iceberg, basically the water level was shown by this green line, 100 picograms per mil, and all the patients uh, were undetectable. With Samoa, we were able to lower the LOD of that assay by over a thousand fold to the point where we could, our limit of detection was six femtograms per mil. And we got hold of uh, 30 samples from, from these patients who, all of whom, as you can see by these blue dots, were below the detection limit of the conventional technology. But with Samoa, we could measure PSA in all of these patients. And in fact, there was actually a, a thousand-fold variation in the concentration of PSA in these, pet, in these patients. So no longer did you say undetectable. Everybody had a, a PSA number. And we uh, used this subsequently in a small clinical trial to show your chances of uh, cancer recurrence uh, could be predicted within months rather than years, as is the case today. So that kind of triggered a whole lot of uh, assay development over the last seven years, and Kevin showed this slide. Uh, as he mentioned, uh, we've developed, or and our customers have developed, assays for over 170 biomarkers. And typically what we see is, in an apples-to-apples -apples comparison with ELISA, we see improvements uh, of greater than a thousand-fold, and in this set of uh, assays that we show here, an average of about uh, 3,000 fold. So uh, really what we're doing is turbocharging uh, ELISA using exactly the same reagents that you, you would use for uh, a regular ELISA. So what is all this sensitivity uh, useful for? Now, uh, over the last six or seven years, these are the main areas that uh, us and our customers have been developing applications in, and uh, Kevin touched on a lot of these. Uh, I'm not going to do a comprehensive review today. I'm going to talk about some really interesting papers that have come out recently. But just to give you a sense of how you can use this uh, capability, infectious diseases is uh, maybe the obvious one where you're trying to detect a smaller number of viruses or bacteria in, in someone before the, the disease progresses to the point where it can't be treated. And the way that people do this today is you use PCR. Um, now, fortunately for us, for each copy of uh, DNA or an RNA in a virus or bacterium, that organism is usually producing thousands of molecules of proteins. So when you combine that natural amplification with the Samoa thousand-fold improvement in sensitivity, we basically have assays that are as sensitive as PCR, and there are a number of publications on this, and I'll give one example in a, in a couple of slides. A reason why doctors are more interested in this is that they really want to measure the, the uh, molecules that are, are causing the disease. You know, typically DNA and RNA do not cause the disease. They cause proteins to be expressed, for example, 
viral toxins or bacterial toxins that cause a disease, and a good, a good example is C. difficile. So that's a reason why people are using the technology there. As Kevin mentioned, an explosive area for Samoa has been neurodegenerative disease, where we're measuring markers that are, were previously only thought detectable in uh, cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, so you either had an MRI to image those molecules or you had a, a spinal tap and measure them in CSF. But we've shown and our customers have shown that small amounts of those molecules do cross the blood-brain barrier and we can detect them in, in blood. So quite remarkably now we're getting correlations between neurological conditions and molecules in, 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 with a blood test. Cancer we've talked about. Uh, obviously there what we're looking at is early detection of cancer biomarkers or the uh, detection of those biomarkers after the after uh, therapy has been administered. A lot of our platform is uh, around cytokines. So these are incredibly important molecules across a number of diseases, not just inflammatory disease, but also immuno-oncology, uh, uh, cardiovascular disease. And what we found was that there were assays for these molecules out there, but they couldn't detect, uh, for example, TNF-alpha or IL-6 in blood, but with, uh, with Samoa's sensitivity, we were able to detect and a lot of drug companies are using this because previously they weren't able to detect whether their drug was hitting the target or not directly. So, but with a blood test now, you can monitor your drug candidates using Samoa. We also have the world's most sensitive troponin test. So cardiovascular diseases is definitely one of the most uh, interesting areas uh, for using Samoa. So now I'm gonna run through uh, a few recent examples. This first example is not so recent, but I do think it sets the stage a little bit. This is a paper that we published uh, on a sixplex uh, for uh, some cytokines, IL-6, TNF-alpha, GMCSF, IL-10, IL-1-alpha, and IL-1-beta. And we were looking at the concentration of these molecules before and after treatment with uh, an anti-TNF drug in patients with Crohn's disease. And we found, it's the first publication, we found that the level of TNF-alpha and these other cytokines dropped after the administration of these drugs. It wasn't a tremendous surprise that they would do this, of course, but it was the first time that anyone had been able to, to actually measure it in blood. We also started to look at uh, the blood of diabetics, because obviously diabetes is an, an autoimmune disease, but no one had really looked at the, the uh, blood levels of, of these cytokines with enough sensitivity and precision. And we showed that there was a statistical significant difference in, between the cytokine profile in, in type 1 diabetics and, and healthy controls. So this uh, publication has really set the stage for a lot of research that, that followed. Um, this is a paper that uh, was published this year by a group at Tufts University, and it was really a very interesting paper for me, and in what they were doing is they were looking at uh, a whole host of uh, cytokines, a panel of about 15, and they, they brought up this panel by a combination of, of uh, multiplex assays and also some singleplex assays. And they were just trying to uh, establish a baseline for these cytokines and also what is the concentration across the population. I think the, the really interesting thing is that not all the different cytokines were the same. So this is what you see uh, here in the black bar. This is the variation within an individual. So you can see that the, the variation within an individual was actually pretty tight. Um, there really wasn't much change o over time. But then you look at the variation within the population and there really was a tremendous difference. For example, IL-8, we saw, uh, or the, the researchers saw, you know, more than a three log variation in the, in the concentration across the population. Whereas some uh, cytokines like TNF-alpha and IL-15 were much more tightly controlled. So I think this really opens up the question is, do you, you know, monitoring and being able to get someone's baseline and see that change over time will be much more important for these cytokines at a much different levels uh, rather than the ones that are more tightly controlled within the, the population. But it's a very nice uh, illustration of the kind of measurements that you can make with, with Samoa. The next um, paper uh, came out of, of Merck, and this was an application of our P24 assay, uh, which is the capsid protein for HIV. And what people have really jumped over Samoa here is looking at latent infection of HIV. So one of the major issues with HIV is that there is no cure right now. So people who are administered the drug basically have to stay on the drug all their life because they're not capable of, of kind of completely destroying the virus 
within a person. That it's stored within tissues. So what drug companies like Merck are trying to do is to try to kind of bring those, those latent viruses out of their hiding place and then slam them with another drug that will truly destroy um, uh, the virus within the body. Now, the challenge that these companies have had in developing these drugs is that they don't have a test that is sensitive enough and specific enough that they can actually make the measurements. So it's become a real challenge. You might say, well, what about PCR? Well, the challenge with PCR is that there's so much variation in the virus across the population at this point, they didn't have a test that would work for everybody. But with our P24 test, which is as sensitive as PCR, and but detects in all of the patients, they're able to take a very small sample, a very low number of cells, and show that it was they were expressing P24, and then hit them with, uh, in this case, Varinostat, which is one of these uh, activators of, of HIV replication and showed an increase, and then administer their own uh, anti-HIV drug to knock it back down again. So this was an example. We, we, we had no idea that this is what our P24 assay was going to be used for, but kind of the, the potential that you have at your hands when you, when you have that kind of sensitivity. The next publication is, is a really nice uh, one to compare. How does Samoa compare to uh, other technologies and also how does it compare across the world? So this was a study that was done by the American Association for Pharmaceutical Scientists. They have a emerging technologies focus group, some of the leading uh, companies. Uh, Biogen, Pfizer, uh, Genentech being amongst them. They were all uh, customers of Quanterix. They all had Samoa instruments. So they said, you know, let's run the same assay across uh, all of our sites and let's compare the data. Let's see what the what kind of variation is. And also to run samples at those different sites, the same samples being run at, run at different sites. And this is the, uh, the, the data that they got. What you see on the top left is the basically the calibration curves across all those different sites. They saw a very nice stability in that. Um, what we, we see here is the, the same samples run across the different sites, you know, subjects raising from sub picogram per mil to hundreds of picogram per mil. And I think for the vast majority of samples, they had very nice reproducibility uh, across the world. I think they had a couple of samples where uh, the data was a bit more variable and they're just trying to work through some of those details. But the kind of CVs that uh, they're able to achieve um, within a run less than 10% and the variation uh, across the different sites was, was very impressive. What they also reported in this paper was a assay, was a pharmacokinetic assay. So they were looking uh, at an antibody drug and they were comparing it with a competing technology uh, based on electrochemiluminescence. And they could show that with the single molecule counting, they actually got a 40 fold improvement in, in sensitivity using Samoa. So this was a really nice example uh, an independent uh, study to show uh, the power of Samoa. My final example before I get onto the SRX is uh, a really amazing molecule that our customers have, have uncovered, uh, neurofilament light. This is uh, one of these uh, CSF markers. Uh, previously, it was only detected in, in CSF, but and there was uh, some uh, researchers in, in Europe uh, led by uh, Henrik Zetterberg and Kai Blenau, and then um, the work in, uh, uh, by Jens Kuhler. And they really wanted to measure this molecule because they thought it was going to be a very specific marker for neurological damage. And they were developing ELISA, ECL assays, and Samoa. And this, they did a comparison between these three measurements before they kind of dived into the, the clinical uh, testing. And this is the data they got. You can see the sensitivity of Samoa. Uh, was sub picograms per mil. This was one their own homebrew, so each of these assays was developed by the customer. Uh, I should say that we've since launched an assay for NFL in collaboration with these customers uh, that is, uh, I think, significantly more sensitive than, than the homebrew assay. We, you know, we have quite a bit of experience here in optimizing sensitivity. Uh, so th this is uh, one of the assays you can buy from Quanterix. And then you can see the direct impact of that. This is the uh, looking at the serum of healthy individuals uh, 33 individuals, and then how many did you miss, basically? And with ELISA and with ECL, you were missing uh, more than half of those patients. And then with Samoa, they could detect uh, NFL in all of those uh, individuals. So this kind of, this was somewhat of a landmark paper in that it triggered a, a lot of clinical testing. And I think there's probably been at least 20 publications now on NFL in a whole host of 
neurological disorders. And this was the one that it came out about two weeks ago and really got my attention um, because it was uh, on ALS. Uh, at the PPH meeting that Kevin talked about, Nancy Freites, who started the Ice Bucket Challenge uh, to help support uh, research in ALS, was, was asking, is it possible to have a biomarker test for ALS? And there are a lot of hopeful people in our audience, but now we're kind of seeing the results of that. And uh, what these research, researchers were, were able to do was look at both uh, neurofilament light, but also heavy chain, and show a significant difference in uh, NFL uh, levels in ALS and other uh, neurological diseases and, and control populations. So you kind of see the rock curves that they can get with this technology. So we're really, really early on with this biomarker, but it does seem to be having a, a, a remarkable impact um, and across a number of different diseases. And kind of my last application slide is almost the beginning of that NFL story, because that NFL story started with customers using our homebrew kit. So what we uh, offer is um, the ability to develop your own assay. So if you have an antibody pair for a protein that, say, Quanterix doesn't have an assay commercialized for, then it's relatively straightforward, uh, and we've trained a lot of people to do this, is develop your own assay. So what you do is you attach your antibody to the beads. Uh, there's some QC of that process. We then uh, biotinylate the detection antibody. You can either do that yourself. We have our own ways to optimize that. And then within just two or three days, uh, on average, people are, are developing assays and getting the hundreds and thousands of fold improvement in sensitivity. And uh, this can all be done with our two instruments and with a, a kit uh, that we sell at the moment. So we're very hopeful in the future that not, uh, not just people in Quanterix, but our customers will be finding the next NFL. What are those markers that will really change uh, uh, healthcare, as Kevin talked about? So now I'll get uh, onto the main attraction today, which is the uh, SRX. This is a, a picture of the instrument. As you can see, uh, it differs quite a bit from our first instrument in that it's a bench top. Um, it's quite a bit smaller, more cost effective. Uh, and um, gives a lot more flexibility to researchers for, for doing uh, some OR assays. It's definitely complementary to the HD1. HD1 is more suited to running very large numbers of clinical samples. This system is uh, maybe more suited to developing assays and to having the flexibility to, to optimize those, those conditions. So for those of you familiar with the HD1, I thought this might be a, a useful slide to go over because what we've done is basically the SRX system which I'll describe, does pretty much everything that the HD1 does. So it runs the same kits, it produces very similar data. Um, so what we've had to do, in effect, is kind of break down the HD1 into, into its components. So for in terms of uh, reagents and um, mixing samples and reagents, we've replaced our reagent bay and our uh, fixed-tip pipetta with uh, an eight-channel pipette and a person and uh, a 96-well plate. Uh, for those of you who know how HD1 works, we incubate the beads with the sample, and that's done in an incubation ring. So what we uh, found gives exactly the same kind of performance is uh, a shaker that you can get uh, from Quanterix, and you can incubate at different temperatures, and it shakes to resuspend those beads uh, in the 96 well plate. The back of the instrument has the wash ring, so what we do is we pellet the beads, uh, aspirate the sample or the reagents, and then wash them. And what we've done is replace that with a microplate uh, washer. And what this does is it performs the same uh, washing capability on 96 samples at a time uh, in an automated process. We've that uh, washing uh, process is, would be quite laborious if you try to do it manually, which is what we were doing early on in the company. But these uh, washers are really very efficient at, uh, and very rapid uh, washing uh, of the beads. And then the final component is the readout. So what we've done is we've taken what we call the LSI, the load seal image module of the HD1, and uh, we put that into uh, a bench top. So what this does is it takes that 96 wall plate, resuspends the beads uh, in a substrate, injects it onto the disc in exactly the same way on the, on the HD1, and then images them uh, and gives the same A, B values that you would get from your HD1. That's kind of taking a step back and, and how things compare. This is really how it works for a user of the SRX. 
and we call it a semi-automated workflow because there is some manual handling, but we really try to minimize that, especially on the resuspension and on the washing side. So uh, a person will start with a 96-watt plate. It's the same plate that we use in the HD1, in fact. And what they do is they uh, pipette out their beads and then add a sample to each of those wells, and you can do 96 at a time. You then put the, um, the plate on a, on a shaker. It resuspends the beads, allows them to distribute uh, the, the protein molecules to distribute across the beads. And uh, we then put them on the washer. They then pellet the beads, remove the sample, and wash those beads. And basically, you just repeat those cycles depending on the number of steps in the assay. So if you have a detection antibody, it does that, and SPG, the enzyme substrate, the enzyme reporter, it, it does that. And uh, right now, with our standard assays, that um, process usually takes about an hour. We have some slightly longer incubation time assays that take about two hours. There's about 30 minutes of, of hands-on time. Once all that's done, the plate is transferred onto the instrument, and I'll describe a bit more how that works in, in a moment. Uh, you, you put the um, plate on, and you load it up with consumer with press go. There's about a five minutes hands-on time, and then uh, a 96 volt plate is read in two hours. So our total time of assay is typically about three, uh, three hours. So this uh, slide kind of gets into the details again of, of the kind of what a sample would see uh, during this process. It's sitting in the 96 volt plate. Uh, you add your sample, incubate, and then pellet, and then it goes through the cycles of detection antibody, enzyme, and washing. And finally, we're left with a, a pellet uh, on the well that is uh, loaded onto the, onto the SRX. So with the SRX, we put uh, a lot of thought uh, into the design of the system and the software to try to make this as easy for a user to, to get going on. Uh, that's why we've been able to reduce the setup time to about um, five minutes. So this is how it works. Um, the first step is uh, to load the plate and the uh, bottle of substrate. So this is uh, all loaded onto a carousel. So when you, if you've seen the, this pre the previous slide, what this presents here is a carousel that rotates to one of four different positions. So in the first position, you load your plate uh, and take the bottle off, cap off the RGP bottle and put, put that on its uh, holder. Uh, then on the software, what you do is you're presented with a 96 well plate and you then define um, whether you're running a sample or a calibrator is pretty straightforward. Uh, obviously, uh, there's no assay definitions in terms of uh, what um, different analyzes you're running on here. That's all, all determined by the, the, the upfront analysis. The, the user then clicks on to the uh, loading of the disks, and if there aren't enough uh, wells, which would be shown by uh, a green, uh, it would be shown by a red uh, warning sign here, then you have to load up some disks. And the disks are exactly the same as HD1 that came in, come in packs of 16. And then you'll have to check, do you have enough tips? Um, it looks like here we don't, so we've got to press on that button and the carousel will turn. And then you, load, you uh, remove the empty rack and load up new tips. And then once you've got everything uh, green, basically you've got your disks, your sump, your plate, your RGP, and the tips, and then your uh, waste is empty, then you're good to go. And uh, you press go and it'll analyze in the, in the two hours. And the workflow is at the end of the run, uh, what people do is just empty out the, the waste where the uh, disks and used tips are, are stored. So it's a very simple uh, workflow. Uh, we've included in the system a machine vision. So we have a camera inside the instrument that is constantly monitoring the resources. Do you have enough tips? Do you have enough disks? And so on. Uh, so that is also uh, a way that we ensure that uh, enough resources are on, are on board. So that's how the uh, instrument works. Uh, what I'm going to do now is walk you through the data. So uh, what I thought would be a good idea was just to show you some of the first data that we produced on the SRX um, by combining uh, offline sample preparation, which is done with uh, multi-channel pipetta and with the um, SRX and the uh, washer uh, across a few of our most uh, uh, interesting assays that we have out, her, out there. So this is uh, an SRX assay for IL-17A. Uh, incubation time was 30 minutes, and then 10-minute uh, incubation with detection and, and SPG. 
This is the AB value that we got across the concentration range. And as you can see, the CV is uh, well below 10%. And we found that we've been able to control uh, all of the kinetics of the process and the reproducibility of the process to have very tight CVs, as you can also get from, from the HD1. This is the assay for P24. This is a very important assay for that uh, latent HIV work that I mentioned. It has a little bit of a longer incubation time uh, than any of the other assays, and it's a two-step assay. So this is an assay where the detection antibody is added with the samples and the bead. But again, we are seeing CVs less than 10% at the Calais, a little bit higher because of some Poisson noise at the very low uh, levels that we have. Right away, we wanted to know how multiplex were working. So one of our uh, most important assays is our neuro fourplex that allows you to measure four of these really critical uh, neurological biomarkers. Uh, so this is the, the next four slides are the, are the data from the same run from uh, for the four different biomarkers. This is the assay for GFAP. As you can see, single digit uh, uh, CVs with a 35 minute uh, incubation time. This is tau. We're able to maintain this very high sensitivity of the tau that is needed to detect in, in serum, again, with uh, single-digit uh, AB, uh, ABCVs. This is UCLH1, which is the third component of this assay. And finally, that very important mark, uh, neurofilament light. So we're able to show that we could get exactly the same data that we got on the HD1 uh, using the SRX. So we're very pleased with the uh, results of this and being able to combine now offline uh, sample uh, preparation with the uh, reader detection. This slide kind of summarizes the data that we have got up to uh, about a couple of weeks ago as we're working to uh, validate all of these kits. So we have about 80 different kits uh, on our menu and we're working our way through validating them on the SRX. Uh, many of them will be available at, at launch. And what we're looking at is looking at the LOD that can be achieved, the uh, on the two platforms, the LOQ that can be achieved on the two platforms. And really very importantly is what, are the, what is the correlation between the sample cor concentration that is determined by the two platforms. Obviously, we wanted uh, the two platforms to produce the same concentration. There is some challenge there because the physical process is different. We have a washer and we have a manual pipetting and then we've got an automated system. But because we're using exactly the same reagents, and we're using the same very much the same incubation times, the same uh, concentrations of things typically, we got a really, really good correlation for uh, our first set of assays uh, between uh, constant samples run on the HD1 and samples run on, on the SRX. So we feel pretty confident that people will be able to use both platforms and publish uh, their data using either instrument and have consistent um, results across those two platforms. When we're looking at the LODs and the LOQs, they're pretty much the same. We get the same kind of backgrounds. We get the same kind of slopes. That's really the beauty of Samoa. This is just a statistical method of distributing molecules across beads. It's, if you can do that correctly, if you can resuspend beads well and wash beads well, you should get the same results. And uh, that's being borne out. Some are a little bit more sensitive on the SRX. Some are a little less sensitive. But that's really within the noise I feel, and we're getting exactly the same sensitivity. So uh, that's good to see as well. Precision is very important. Precision is something that we live and die with uh, every day at Quanterix. This is the uh, assay precision within run and between runs uh, for uh, a series of about 10 different assays uh, that we have validated at the moment. And as you can see, we're able to get CVs below 10% uh, for all of those assays. So it's, it's a really nice, uh, precise method. Um, one thing we've put a lot of work into for the last two years or so is really making sure that you've got the same data across that plate. Because for the, those of you who know about the HT1, the uh, immunocomplex is uh, happening in a cuvette that's processed one at a time, so you can get exactly the same conditions for each of those cuvettes. When you've got a 96 watt plate, it's a little different. You've got a, a, a format where each different sample is actually in a different well. But by taking a lot of care over the chemistry and how reagents are added and the timing of the process, we're able to get very stable signals across our plates and uh, keep up signals and have that great precision. So that's been uh, one of the strengths of the SRX as, it, as it's coming out now. 
So as I said, Multiplex is very important to Samoa and Samoa customers, and we uh, one of the assays I mentioned is that we uh, is the Neurofourplex. So this is uh, data from the Neurofourplex from our validation package. Uh, we got the four different proteins. These are the curves of A, B as a function of the concentration of the proteins. Uh, I don't have the zero here, so you don't see the background, but you can see that the, the concentrations uh, go into the, the sub picomolar levels. We've got the same sensitivity for each of these four biomarkers. What we did is we validated samples in serum plasma and CSF uh, in our fourplex and showed very nice data comparable to HD1 uh, for each of those four markers. So we feel really good that the multiplex capability on the HD1 has been translated into um, into the SRX. This is the specifications. Uh, I won't. It's a bit of a, a eyesore this in this slide, but uh, just in terms of the the analytical LOD, the uh, LOQ dilution linearity, and the precision of our method, we've gone through a few a full validation of our kits on the SRX as we have on the HD1. So when you get them, you can be confident that you're going to be getting uh, data of, of high quality and it it all checks out uh, very nicely. We're not stopping there. We're really pushing um, the capabilities of Multiplex and we're pleased that we're, we'll be able to, to uh, soon launch uh, the Sixplex on the SRX. Uh, these are the data from uh, the Sixplex. This, this is a cytokine Sixplex. It's really aimed at the immuno-oncology field. So we've got some real key markers to the IO field interferon gamma is obviously kind of a, the key protein in the checkpoint inhibition cascade and that's in there. TNF alpha IL6 uh, and these other interleukins. And this was a panel that we put together by talking to some of the leading lights in the immuno-oncology area. And we've been able to get very high sensitivity with this sixplex. We're very pleased with it. And uh, basically in this case, we're not looking at CSF so much we're looking at plasma and serum because that's the most common sample type. So uh, this is uh, the data that's coming out of the validation uh, process on the instruments. And so we're pretty excited by this sixplex and the ability or the capability they might have in the uh, immuno-oncology field. And in the next uh, coming months and, and years, you're going to see higher and higher plexes coming uh, out of Quanterix and being able to run on these two, two instruments. So just uh, in, in kind of uh, describing an instrument for the first time, we did want to like kind of give one more thing uh, that we're particularly excited about, and uh, Kevin did mention this. Uh, Samoa has really make, made its mark in the area of immunoassays, measuring proteins at very low levels. But we've been working diligently in, in, in the past years with uh, many of our partners to try to use the same technique, the same approach to detect nucleic acids because we really do hear from customers that there are, there are challenges with, with kind of the, the current method, which is PCR. And, and PCR, the, the main challenge that we've heard is, is purification. So having to purify out DNA or RNA from your sample really does cause a lot of workflow issues, the reproducibility, the stability of the molecule once it's purified really does raise challenges for people in PCR. Even though it's incredibly sensitive and an incredibly successful technology, you know, people are, are looking for more. So we set ourselves a goal of trying to achieve PCR-like performance, but doing direct detection. And there's been some publications over the years, but it hasn't really broken through. But we feel right now that we're on the verge of, of a major breakthrough. There were two publications in the summer that uh, illustrate that. And really, it's the SRX reader that has enabled it truly to occur because the HD1 was really designed for proteins, it's really tailored for proteins, but with nucleic acids, you need a lot more control over temperature, type of buffers you use, incubation conditions. So we needed that kind of offline capability to, to uh, make this happen. So two publications that appeared, one was from Tufts University, uh, David Walt's lab, and what they did is they used locked nucleic acids to measure uh, microRNA 141, 21, and 16 using locked nucleic acids, and they got LODs that were very similar to, to uh, PCR. It's a really elegant paper. We since reproduced this work at Quanterix and we developed our own microRNA 122 assay using not nucleic acids. It, it really seems to have been a big breakthrough that they came up with at Tufts. From our lab, we also had a publication where we were using 
uh, peptide nucleic acid, PNA, to measure microRNA 122. This was in collaboration with Destina Genomics, who have a unique specific labeling chemistry that puts a single label base on a particular site of a nucleic acid, enable you to measure with a single probe very short sequences of nucleic acid. So we were looking at microRNA 122. We worked with James Deere at the University of Edinburgh, and we were able to distinguish people with drug-induced liver injury from healthy individuals. Uh, should say both of these publications were done on the HD1, uh, but now with the SRX, we've really been able to take it to the next level. So this workflow shows how we do direct detection. So we're, we're doing away with purification of nucleic acids. So what we have is a well, and this is on a 96 well now, uh, just one is shown here. You have your sample, whether it's nucleic acid and all the other stuff. This is serum or plasma, typically. The magnetic beads are added to that. They hybridize, uh, usually for about an hour. We then separate with a magnet, wash the beads. And in the case of when we're working with Destina, we do their unique chemistry where we incorporate a biotin at a, at a specific site on the probe. Uh, we then separate the beads, wash them again, and then label them with SBG. Uh, and this is all, I should say, done on exactly the same equipment I talked about earlier, the, the Samoa washer and the SRX. It really looks exactly like an immunoassay, but now we're getting uh, nucleic acid uh, measurements out of it. Uh, so again, you do exactly the same thing. You load up your plate tips and disks and RGP, and within a couple of hours, you've now read a 96 well sam plate sample. Uh, and the whole workflow just takes uh, a couple, uh, two or three hours now uh, with this new process. So we're pretty excited about this. And this is kind of data. This is very early. We're just doing this uh, for the very first time in the last few weeks. Uh, this was uh, some rat samples. So we're able to detect microRNA 122 in very low volumes of plasma or serum from rats and, and humans. So these are. 12 rat samples that we got. We have not yet had these data unblinded. This is from a major pharmaceutical company. Uh, they were kind enough to let us share the data. We don't. We know there's two groups. You can maybe look at the data and guess what those two groups are. Uh, but we're able to, in these samples on the right, detect uh, directly in two microliters of plasma uh, from rat, uh, the microRNA 122. So uh, this is uh, very promising. Uh, James Dears was kind enough to send us some uh, more plasma from patients with drug-induced liver injuries, silly, and healthy controls. And this is a comparison of when you direct detect, when you add the beads directly to the sample, and then when you purify the RNA and detect. And as you can see, the signals go down about fivefold when you purify RNA. So this is really fantastic news for us because we're now getting the benefit of direct detection, not having to purify and lose through the purification process, lose through degradation of RNA uh, once it's purified. The exosomes or other biological materials seem to stabilize the microRNA 122. So we're very excited about this, and we're going to continue working and hopefully provide some kits for customers in uh, 2018. So I have about two minutes left. Just want to summarize that we now have two instruments at Quanterix. One is a benchtop system with a lot more flexibility based on a, a reader a microplate washer and a shaker. Both offer the sensitivity. One is a bench top, one is a floor standing. One is semi-automated, one is completely automated. But both offer access to the uh, now, I think, over 80 assays that we have and our homebrew capabilities. So with exactly the same data, exactly the same kits, depending on what your needs are, then you have the choice uh, which way you want to go. So I just want to thank everybody for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, please do reach out. Um, I'm going to try to, we have about one minute left, so I'm going to see what people have been asking us about as we've been talking. I'm just scrolling down here. Uh, Mitchell King, it seems the technology could be powerful for measuring biomarkers in CSF, given the low concentrations of may analyze in CSF. Have you used your uh, Samoa to measure biomarkers in CSF? The answer is a resounding yes. We, we didn't really think that at the start, Michael. Um, we, uh, but people really need that sensitivity and the ability to dilute the sample. And so I think for all of our neuroassays now, we validate in both CSF and plasma and serum. And there's probably 20, 30 publications doing the correlations between those two. So yeah, it's a big application. Uh, 
Uh, Sally's asking, your LLQs are lower than your last point. Uh, that's right, Sally. Uh, I didn't include the uh, zero calibrator because um, uh, it looked a bit strange when I plotted it, but uh, happy to share that data with you. The package inserts will have a lot more data on the um, on the six and the fourplex. That was uh, my inability to present things more than more than anything else. Uh, Greg Loy, samples are bright. Is read time still two hours? That's a great question. The read time, I should say, the read time is actually just 45 seconds per sample, but we do them one at a time, and that's why it takes two hours. And uh, so we basically do 30 seconds. Uh, exposure time or, or read time and that is enough to get to single molecule and also we have enough dynamic range on the ca camera that we can see um, ABs of about 30. In fact the dynamic range on the SRX camera is actually a bit better than on the HD1 so we think that we've got a bit more dynamic range with the new instrument. Uh, do you need to be carry careful about carryover on the washer? and more maintenance? That's a great question. Um, we've done some carryover studies. We the, the thing is, I don't know, Rachel, if you're familiar with the um, these bead washers, I think you probably are, but they're, they're very thorough washing. And so we're very much like the HD1, we think it's gonna have a very, very low carryover. Um, the maintenance, um, it's actually pretty similar to the HD1. There's a start of day and an end of day. Uh, just so you're not leaving salt in the tubes overnight. Um, and then there's an idle maintenance. There's a monthly maintenance that we found is pretty important. Uh, so we found that if people do those, uh, they can get their good data. But we have a lot of documentation and uh, training around that that we'll do with customers. Uh, Greg Law, has, has anyone proven Samoa for exosome biomarkers? That's another great question, Greg. Uh, yes, that's a really big area for us. We have uh, PPH, um, there were some really exciting presentations from people looking, uh, both quantifying the number of exosomes from markers on the exosomes, but also measuring the markers within exosomes. So exosomes actually provide a, an enhancement because they um, kind of purify the marker. And then when you combine that with our sensitivity, this one group showed a, about a 20,000 fold improvement in sensitivity on exosomes. Uh, I believe there's a couple of publications. There's a publication on tau in exosomes, uh, and we're actually working on a tech note um, to give people the uh, basically a, a, a recipe for measuring molecules in exosomes using Samoa. That should be coming out uh, in early 2018. Charles asks, for homebrew applications, how tricky is it to get antibodies that are good enough to avoid background nonspecific binding issues? Another great question, some great questions today. Um, it's something, I, it's something you've really got to watch out for in terms of trickiness. We've been very successful in finding antibodies. Uh, what we found is if you, mostly because people have put a lot of effort in the past on ELISAs, so if you have a good ELISA pair, it isn't a problem. Um, what we find when we do an assay development, you know, we'll screen, say, five different antibody pairs and find the ones with the lowest background, the lowest nonspecific interactions. But there is a kind of almost natural selection uh, on this in that we uh, ELISA pairs tend to be low background. So that's um, been pretty uh, good. Um, some examples have actually had to go proactively out and develop our own antibodies, have special partnerships with companies that have those good reagents. And that's something we're definitely going to be doing more of in, in the future. Bring you to... Okay. Okay, lots of good questions today. Uh, uh, above? Um, is an emergency stop oh. Emergency standards have flagged errors. Uh, that's a good question. I don't think so, but I think it's something that can be done. What um, with SRX, there is a capability to stop the mess, to stop the process. What we've shown is that the plate, once it leaves the washer, is stable for at least a day um, before it needs to be run. Um, so we can actually stop the process. I don't think in the software we've actually proactively put a stop in, but it's probably something that we need to have in the future. So what I'll do is I'll talk to the software team and we'll try to get that into a, a future. I shouldn't be making promises for the software team, mate. <laughs> but uh, that's 
definitely a capability that we could work on in the future. I think there was one more. Moving towards a point of care format, how do you meet sample preps being performed, miniaturized and automated? Another good question. We put a lot of thought into that. Um, we actually think that this platform is could be well suited to do a point of care. Obviously, we've designed it to analyze 96 samples at a time, but we think that we could come up with a cartridge that could do one at a time. Um, and we've also put quite a lot of thought into microfluidic approaches. So um, strategically, Quanterix is not actively developing those systems, but the technology is definitely converging and we've got partners who, who uh, are actively engaged in that kind of work. But, um, and there has actually been, none of this has been published, although there was one poster at AACC where uh, this has been, um, point of care Samoa has been demonstrated. So I would say an active area of research and development. So we've gone over quite a bit, sorry about that, but there were, there were a lot of great questions. Um, I would say if you have any more questions or um, if you're interested in learning more at the SRX or the HD1, please do reach out and um, we're going to be talking about it a lot in the coming months um, at different uh, conferences. And uh, we're just really looking forward to getting this in your hands. I uh, just want to thank the entire Quanterix team. This has been an incredible effort to make this happen at so many levels with our partners. And we're really excited about this new instrument to kind of match the vision that, that Kevin described right at, at the start of enabling um, healthcare in the future. So thanks for your attention and, and please do get in touch. Cheers. Bye.